Canadian army has been growing in England for more than two years. The English housewife has tried to give them a home, but they have suspended their lives and joined an army to fight, and so far they have not been called. They want to get into it, to get it over and get back. There are thousands who want them to have that chance. If Russia can do what she has done alone, if Britain could do what she did alone, what could both of us do to Hitler? With the United States and China beside us as well, if we were bound into one shattering striking force, united in strategy and united in determination. The cries are not limited to the soapboxes. In the highest circles, Russia is urging her allies to strike from the West. The Western powers aren't ready to invade, but they are ready for a dress rehearsal. And the planning is in the hands of a single-minded expert. Lord Louis Mountbatten, the commando chief, picks the men for the job. The Canadian High Command has been approached with the plan. The generals know that their men must soon see action. The maneuvers are losing meaning. The men are losing their edge. Two brigades from the 2nd Canadian Division are chosen for Mountbatten's audacious enterprise. At 2nd Division headquarters, they study intelligence reports on German fortifications along the Channel coast. The German defenses are formidable and are growing. Adolf Hitler has reinforced his garrisons and ordered an Atlantic wall of concrete. The Prussian von Rundstedt commands it. Von Rundstedt knows that the summer ahead will be heavy with danger. One of his divisions is the 302nd. Like the others, this formation is being brought to full strength. It is responsible for a small French port. To vacationers, Dieppe had always meant soft, sunny days on the sand. One terrible day will change that image forever. It is here the Canadians will strike. This is the plan. A frontal assault on the town, which will be preceded by four flanking attacks. They will take the town, destroy installations, collect intelligence, take prisoners, and withdraw that same day. It is the dress rehearsal for invasion. On the Isle of Wight, training begins. The first exercise is a failure. The second is more successful. They feel they are ready, and the raid is set for early July when moon and tide will be favorable. All they need is the weather. They don't get the weather, the period has passed, and they are on their way back to camp. For the Canadians, it is a sickening disappointment. Are they just tin soldiers who will never fight? In the pubs of South England, Dieppe is discussed and forgotten. But unknown to the foot soldier, the raid is still very much alive. August 18th, 1942. 237 ships and landing craft sail out under the moon to Dieppe. For a thousand crouching men, it is the last night on Earth. They have embarked swiftly, and the Germans do not know they are coming. But the enemy does know conditions are favorable, and the whole occupied coast is on standing alert. There are 5,000 Canadians and 1,000 British commando men. Their success depends on absolute precision. At 3.47 a.m., the schedule is disrupted. A small 
small German convoy accidentally encounters the left column of the assault force. The engagement lasts barely five minutes, but the landing craft are scattered and the Germans east of Dieppe are alerted. The whole operation is already in jeopardy. They were to touch down during half light before daybreak. They are late and the day has broken. support is not heavy and has been held back to the last moment to guard the element of surprise. Air Force has done its first job well, but unforeseen delays at sea give the German that deep breath he needs to throw off the shock of the bombs. Many of the landing craft are late. Some will miss their objective. Much of the surprise is gone, and the sun shines brightly down. Only a handful of men ever reach the streets of Dieppe, and they are hopelessly outnumbered. <laughs> Offshore, the commanders wait vainly for word on the battle. There are no reliable reports, but they decide to send in the reserves. There is no success to reinforce. They find the beaches already bright with blood. the BBC in London, a life-saving announcement is beamed out to the citizens of Dieppe. Il y a quelques heures, qu'un coup de main se poursuit dans le secteur de Dieppe, sur la côte nord de la France, contre les forces d'occupation allemandes. The people are told that this is a raid, not an invasion. They are warned to take no risks. Do not get involved, they are told. Do not expose yourself to German reprisals. You will be needed when the invasion comes. 
La France et ses alliés auront besoin de vous. By now, every available German combat pilot in Northwest Europe is scrambling for the sky over Dieppe. They go to meet 65 Allied squadrons, eight of them Canadian. Above the tortured beaches, the sky is laced with flame. Allied fighters must pull 500 German planes from the backs of the infantrymen. Otherwise, there can be no withdrawal. It was one of the most terrible air battles ever fought. 106 Allied planes were destroyed to only 48 of the enemy. But the German pilot had been drawn away from the men and the ships below. Now, everything rested with the Navy. For helpless hours, they could do little but watch. But while there was smoke and fire on the horizon, some men still lived and fought. To save these men, the landing craft must ride into the cannon, and many would never ride out. They were impatient for the signal, and they got it. To reach the little ships, the men must cross the beach. The beach along that awful seashore was alive with German steel. Germans thought they had a full invasion. Reinforcements were coming. Earth, sky and sea had turned to fire and the withdrawal from Dieppe had become an escape from hell.
On the night before, 5,000 Canadians had left England. Only 2,100 were going back. The ships could delay no longer, or even these men would be lost. At two minutes to two in the afternoon, the last German shell had been fired. Unbelievably, it had all happened in only nine hours. Almost 2,800 Canadians had been left behind. 906 of these were dying or were dead. For 1,946 Canadian prisoners, the whole shooting war had lasted less than a day. Some men on the way back wept. Some talked too loudly. Others seemed vacant. There was a layer of deep shock over all as the indescribable tension slowly lifted. 